I've never done this before, um, so you're going to have to listen carefully and follow me along tonight as we will be doing a lot of reading. Matter of fact, it's going to be uh, what they call expository preaching, which means uh, you just take it verse by verse by verse and go through it. Many times I use topical preaching, where you make an outline, preach on a subject, and uh, uh, there's, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. But this will be expository, verse by verse, preaching tonight. Now, what you're getting ready to read tonight in the Bible is not a pretty picture. But the thing about the Bible, it's not just a sweet little book of fairy, fairy tales like some people think. And it's not just a sweet little book of true stories as some people think. It tells it like it is, good, bad, and ugly. And it tells about human nature. So take your Bible tonight, open to the book of Judges, chapter 19. The book of Judges, chapter number 19. I announced that I'd be preaching on the saddest story, strangest story, and maybe saddest too, so, uh, for the death on the cross of the Lord Jesus in the Bible. Judges, chapter number 19. The only way you can get this is we'll do chapter 19 and 20. So stay with me tonight as we go through this. Uh, and you're going to say, Lord, the preacher preached on two whole chapters. That's right. That's right. You ain't got nowhere to go for a while. So uh, we're going to get in the book tonight. Let's get the book. The book above all books. The book of Judges. We're going to use this study tonight as a launching pad to do our Judges study that we're going to begin on Wednesday night in just a week or two. On Wednesday night, we're going to be going through the book of Judges, verse by verse. One of the most amazing books in the Bible. The book of Judges tells about the great law of human collapse. And what that means is, when God don't intervene, people just go mad to worse. They get right, they call on the Lord, He deliver them, and then they get backslid. Then they get right, then they call on the Lord, and He would deliver them. And then they get back slid, and then he'd get right, and they call on the Lord, and he would deliver them, and then they get back, just like you do. Just like we did. We go, we go through time when we're on fire for God, he blesses us, and then we slack up a little bit, and bam, we hit the deck. And then we cry out, and God helps us. And then you just go, get to go in a circle. So tonight, that's what the book of Judges is about. It's the book of moral decay. The book of Judges teaches opposite of evolution. Anything left to itself goes to pieces. It goes, it rots. And without divine intervention. Now here in the book of Judges, we'll start with verse number one. And the key to understanding the book of Judges is the very last verse in the whole book and said there was no king in Israel in those days. Every man did that was right in his own eyes. Anarchy. And brother, that's exactly where we're headed in our country tonight. And I'll, I was already there. Judges 19. Here we go. Now you read it with me, and I'm going to stop and comment on the verses. The strangest story in the Bible. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. This was before the time of the king. There was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim. Stop. Now, uh, Levites were the priesthood. They were the tribe that God had chosen to be the priesthood. There's 12 tribes, Levi, Benjamin, Ephraim, Naphtali, uh, Judah, all of them tribes, you know, 12 of them. And this is a tribe of Levi. He was a Levite in the priesthood. Who took to him, verse 1, a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, it brings up the question, what is a concubine? If you read the Bible, you see that pop up over and over and over. Now, you're going to have to help me tonight. You're going to have to put yourself in that day and time. You got to, to understand this story, you're going to have to be able to put yourself back in those days. Things ain't like they are now. You ladies are really, really not going to like that. And, and you, you better be glad you're living when you're living now. A concubine in the Old Testament was, to, to put it bluntly, a, a, like a second-hand wife. And they had many of them, many of them. And they had all the responsibilities, all the duties, all the privileges of a wife, but were not elevated to the, to the A class of being called a wife. Uh, you can't understand that. 
but you can try to put yourself in that time. They were living in a different time completely. God never ordained that. There's no evidence in the Bible he ever even wanted it. But they did it. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. They said he's the smartest man in the world. He wasn't too smart, was he? I mean, a thousand wives. That's three birthdays a day that he had to remember. Three birthdays a day. Three anniversaries a day. So he took a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now look what happened. Verse 2. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him. She left him, went back home to her daddy's house, and just whored around for four months. Four whole months. She played the whore. Now, she either found a boyfriend and went and shacked up, which I doubt seriously is that's what it was, or she became a prostitute and sold herself around the, the country, or else she just went out and partied every weekend and was different men every week. That's very plain, but she went out. Four months, she played the whore. In the Old Testament, the sentence of that was death. She, she could have been stoned. And, and under the law would have been stoned. Four months she left her husband and went and played the whore. Now look at verse 3. And her husband arose and went after her. He didn't go file for divorce. He didn't say, I'll kill her if I ever see her again. He went after her to speak friendly unto her. Whew. Pretty good man, huh? Pretty good man. And to bring her again. He didn't know if she had diseases. He didn't know how many men she had been with. And he went all the way down there and was talking nice to her, honey. I want us to get back together. I love you. He didn't have to do that. Under the law, he was not required to do that. He did that because he was a good man. I'm telling you this because you're really going to hate this guy in a little while. But I'm telling you, look at him here. He went and spoke friendly unto his wife and having his servants with him, a couple of asses. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And he met his, he met his father-in-law there and they moved in. Daddy said, well, hey, you come on in here. She's moved back home. Uh, I, I, there's all kinds of implications there. I don't know where the mama was. Don't mention her. I don't know if the daddy should have just said, hey, you married him, stay with him, you know. I, I don't know what all the implications are there. But anyway, the daddy said, you come on in now. She's moved back in with me, and y'all stay a while. Let's get to know each other. Let's talk for a little while. Verse number uh, 4. And his father-in-law retained him. And he abode with him three days, and they did eat and drink and lodge there. Verse 5. And it came to pass on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning, so that he rose to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. And they sat down and did eat and drink, both of them together. We're in verse 6 now. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night, and let thine heart be merry. And when the man arose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him, therefore he lodged there again. Verse 8, And he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until afternoon, and they did eat both of them. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine, they had got back together and worked things out. She was going back home with him. She'd give up all her boyfriends and all her whoredoms, went and had a STD test and, and made prom and read, read done their vows or whatever they done. And, and the father-in-law and the damsel's father said unto him, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening. I pray tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here that thine heart may be merry. And tomorrow get you early on your way that thou mayest go home. But the man would not tarry that night and rose up and departed. Hold your finger on verse 10. Now here's the way it went. They stayed a day, 
another day, another day, another day. And every day, her daddy would say, y'all don't leave. Stay one more night. Oh, come on. It's, it's, too, it's too, too pretty a day. Let's have a picnic. We'll cook out and get some hamburgers and hot dogs. And we'll have a catch up on old times. And don't leave. And then he'd start to leave at night. He'd say, don't leave tonight. It's getting dark. Y'all just stay. How many of you have ever went to visit relatives and you really, really wanted to leave? And they kept talking. Uh, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Well, uh, 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 but, you know, they keep saying, oh, come on. Just stay a little while. Just stay. Uh, that's, uh, that's awful to be stuck at your mother-in-law's uh, somewhere. Uh, amen. <laughs> One honest man right over here. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, they wanted to, they find, so finally they left. Now, uh, it's, it's the story starting to unfold here. Verse 10. But the man would not tarry that night, but rose up and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. We know that as Jerusalem. The whore is named that. And there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine also was with him. They got back together. They was holding hands, going down the road. Verse 11. And when they were by Jabus, the day was far spent. And the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, let us turn into this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over unto Gibeah. Now, they had not yet chased out the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. That happens later on. So they, 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 uh, the Jebusites were still there, and the Jebusites were pagan. So they wanted to spend the night there, and he said, No, we ain't spend the night here. These people's wicked. These people's crazy. We're going to go somewhere of the children of Israel. And uh, so they passed on, and these people are pagan. Now, look here, what happened? And verse number 13, and he said, Come, let us draw near to one of these places to lodge in, in Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongeth to Benjamin. Now, Benjamin was one of the tribes. So they said, now, now we can stay in this town because Benjamin is one of us. We ain't going to stay in them week. Lord, we ain't staying in Las Vegas or New York City. Uh, we'll stay in this town who's, who's, who's related to us, Benjamin. Verse number 15. And they turned aside thither to go in and lodge in Gibeah. And, and when he went in, he sat down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodge in. Lord, have mercy. Isn't that something? Isn't that sad? No, no Tom Bodell to leave the light on for you. Uh, no Motel 6. No, no, uh, no Comfort Inn. No Holiday Inn. No, as a matter of fact, in these cities, there was no king in Israel. And there were, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And when it said they had an inn, like an I-N-N, most of the time all it was was a shed with a roof over top of it and no walls or nothing. That's where they lodged all night. And they didn't have nowhere to stay. Him, his donkeys, and his concubine, and, and nobody wouldn't offer them a place to stay. That's sort of, that's significant. Nobody, nobody would take them in. Nobody would go speak to the visitors. Uh, amen? Uh, like it is around here sometimes. Nobody would have the visitors come in and, be a, and, and, and spend the night. So they didn't want them to come in. Verse number 16. And behold, there came out an old man from his work out of the field. He is old, still had to work. Wasn't retired, but the Bible said he was an old man. But he worked in the field all day at evening, which was the Mount Ephraim. And he sojourned in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjamites. So this old man lifted up his eyes, and he saw this guy and his wife coming through the street and said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? And he said unto them, We're just passing through. We're passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence am I, and I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man that received me to house. He said, We're just passing through. We're coming from Bethlehem, Judah, going to the house of the Lord. I'm taking my wife to church. We're going to the house of the Lord, and we've got straw and provender enough for our asses. We've got bread. We've got wine. We've got everything we need. All we need is just a place to sleep. Just hang our head, our hats up for tonight, and uh, we'll, we'll have just a place to sleep. That's all we request. Now, stop right here one more time. What could he say? What did he say? He said, we're just passing through. Going he, didn't, he didn't get bitter, and he wasn't like a lot of people said, 
what are you doing here? He'd have said, I'll tell you what we're doing here. My good-for-nothing, no-count wife here won't stay home and faithful, and she's been out whoring around, and we're out here in the middle of the night with nowhere to sleep, and it's all her fault. He didn't do that, did he? Good man. I say that because you're really going to not like this guy in a few more verses. As the old saying is, you'd have had to have been there. And you've got to put yourself back in these times. To, uh, uh, every, I, I listen to sermon after sermon. I read stories. I read, I've been studying this for two months, these two chapters. And almost every one of them come from the slant of this good-for-nothing man who was a horrible man. Now, I'm not justifying everything he done. But you've got to look at the whole picture in a person's life. And we'll tell you what we're going to do tonight. Here we go. Verse 20. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever. It said he was old again. He must have really been old. Lord. Uh, Peace be with thee. Howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me. Only lodge not in the street. For some reason, that old man did not want him out there in them streets that night. He said, You don't need to be out here in these streets. So he brought him into his house and gave him provender under the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now, here the story's about to take a turn for the worse. The old man brought him in. He said, now y'all sit down here. You're going to And he locked the doors, and uh, he said, uh, there is no king in Israel. There ain't no police department. We can't call 911. I mean, uh, y'all come on in here. Lock the door. And that old man knew what kind of a wicked place he lived in. And hold your finger there. The, it's, the story's about ready to get bad here. And, and he, he locked the doors. They sat down. They started eating supper and drinking. And about that time, somebody started beating on the door. Verse 22. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial. What's Belial? That's the devil in the Old Testament. Belial, some people call it. Belial. See that liar in the middle of it? L-I-A? Like liar? That's a picture of Satan in the Old Testament. And a children of Belial was, by definition, a worthless, wicked man. A worthless, wicked man. Lawless person. They begin to beat at the doors of that old man's house. Now let's look and see what happened. They set the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. That's written so that it won't be too graphic for our younger audience here tonight. But if you know the Bible, you know that the Bible said Adam knew his wife Eve and she bore a son. Adam knew. It didn't talk about, hey, shake hands. It talked about when they came together in a sexual union, physical union, knowing in the Old Testament. He knew her. And those men got around that door, that house, and started beating at that door, said, bring that man. They saw that girl go in with him. They said, bring that man out here. That we may know him. So we got here a story of militant homosexuality. And the men of the city, don't, don't think this is too strange. The same thing happened in San Francisco a few years ago at the Hamilton Street Baptist Church when they had a speaker in they didn't like and homosexuals, I got it on video, gathered around and beat the door of that church nearly in and an elderly lady got knocked down and a handicapped person was hurt and they beat at the door just like they did in Genesis 19 in the days of Lot. Militant homosexuality. When homosexuality gets a hold of a nation or a culture, they become militant. You don't, if they want to say put up with, they don't just say put up with us. They don't, finally it ain't just tolerate us. You got to like us. And finally, you got to be one of us. Now let's see what happened. Bring forth the man out of thine house that we may know him. Lord in mercy. You are in an area about to be judged by God when it's not safe to get out on the streets at night. 
There was a time in America when you could walk down the street of an average American town at night with your family. Not you don't. I guarantee you don't do it now in Charlotte. I guarantee you won't do it in Asheville in a lot of places. There are certain places. I mean, would you walk down the street in Washington D.C., New York, Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston, Texas? No, sir. It's the same now as it was then, except about 5,000 times worse today. Verse 23, And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said, Nay, my brethren, no, don't do so wickedly. See, that old man knew that what they want to do was wicked. He didn't say it's an alternate lifestyle. He didn't say, this is your choice, but I choose not. He said, this is wicked! Seeing that this man is coming to my house, do not this folly. Now here we go. Look at the twist this story takes. Verse 24. Behold, here is my daughter. The old man had a daughter who was a virgin, young girl. And his, the man, Levite's concubine. Them will I bring out now. Humble ye them and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile of a thing. Our culture today is being given over to this kind of thing. It is nothing for our kids to turn TV on, even regular TV, and see two girls kissing each other. It is nothing anymore for kids in this church to tell me, they say, uh, uh, Brother Danny, that kid's gay, and that kid has a girlfriend, and that girl has a girlfriend. And she has, it's nothing. Kids, and we never even dreamed of something like that being real when I was their age. Never even thought about it. He come out and he said, the, uh, Rob Bell, one of the leaders of the emergent church that I'm going to be preaching on here a lot in the next few weeks, has now come out and said, gay marriage is okay. He's okay with it. Pro-gay marriage. The church, leaders of the church in this country tonight are starting to change their position on homosexuality. You know, pressure, money, big shot, power, pressure to give in. And, it, and what it is is I work with this person and they are gay and they are so nice. And they take care of their kids and they are so nice. How could you possibly say they're sinning? That's how, that's how it happens. So he said, look. You say, how could a man do that? He offered him his daughter. He ought to be shot. You'd have had to been there. I'm not saying he was right. I'm not saying I would have done that. If somebody came to my house, you know, they'd have to kill me before they got one of my daughters. Right? Ain't that the way all of us men feel? Things were weird back then. I'm not justifying. This guy wasn't right by doing this. You go through me if you're going to get one of mine. And that's exactly probably what would have happened. He'd have stepped out and tried to stop him. They'd have killed him and got him anyway. So this man got scared and compromised and he said, look, just take my daughter and this man's concubine. You say, Brother Danny, I don't never, I can't believe that. Sorry. All you men look up here at me tonight. You listen to me. All you men listen to me tonight. Your men sitting right here tonight, you'd say, I'd never let them come in my house and get one of my kids. And you're worse than that. You've got HBO and Netflix. You let them see it. If you let them see it, you're letting them come into your house. you will be ashamed of yourself. Don't be ashamed of yourself. Now, if you don't let them see nothing like that, thank God. Hats off to you. If you let them listen to dirty music and dirty, watch dirty TV shows, don't criticize this guy. You're just giving them your daughter. You're giving them your son. So he said, here, take my daughter. Verse 24. My daughter, do with her what seemeth good. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. Notice something else. This man, this man said, them guys raping his daughter and concubine was not near as bad as a homosexual act. Do not so vile a thing. We say, it ain't no different. Yes, it is. It sure is. And all the men of the Israel, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Next verse, 20, 25. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth. They didn't get the daughter, that old man. 
They got the concubine, and he brought her forth to them, and they knew her and abused her, verse 25, all the night until the morning. They raped that woman and abused her. You hear them screaming, and those wicked men having their way there all night long until the morning, and when the day began to spring, they let her go. Why? Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. As soon as it got light, they said, okay, we're done. Let's get her out of here. Get her out of here. They like that darkness. They like that dark. Watch. That's why I tell you kids, don't be out in the middle of the night. Don't be out at 11, 30, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock more. You'll get yourself into trouble. Amen? God made the dark time to sleep in. Not to go out running all over creation hunting you a girlfriend. They knew her and abused her all night long. That's awful. That's awful. Hold it. You say, that's sorry, good for nothing man. Let him have his concubine. Wait just a second. Just a second. Let's put it in perspective. Why were they even there to start with? You say, you blaming her? No. If you say I'm blaming this woman, you're listening to demons. Hear me. Look at my voice. I am not blaming her. But that's why they was there to start with. If they'd, have, they'd have been at home watching Bonanza, brother, eating popcorn and reading the Bible and had going to sleep if she hadn't went out and played the whore. You got to look the whole picture. Now, I feel a little kick here tonight. And I feel like some of you are saying, I don't like what you're saying. It, uh, all I know to tell you is, I'm going to preach you this Bible, and that's what God called me to do. And if you're right with God, you will appreciate it. You'll appreciate it. You'll appreciate it. I wouldn't give you a dime for a preacher that tried to cut corners on this book and now you can say something it don't say. I'm not a male chauvinist. I'm not blaming this woman. I, everybody had their part of blame. The old man, the man, the concubine. I'm not saying the man was right. He was wrong. But see, he'd seen, her, he'd seen her that way before. He, he, she had been out with men for four months. He figured nothing new to her. Until you've had to chase your wife down at a relative's house and when you get there, she's gone with her boyfriend and you don't know where they can't find and won't answer your calls or text or whatever and then you finally find her and you're embarrassed and hurt and think she might have a disease to give to you, I'd be a little careful I've took men out in the middle of the night hunting their wives. More than once, more than twice. Until you've had to chase your wife down in another state somewhere and hunt her and, and know those feelings, you better, you better ease up on your judgment of this man. You might not know what you're talking about. Watch this. Verse 25, when the day began to spring forth, they let her go. 26, then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was. They called him Lord in the Old Testament like Sarah called Abraham Lord. They still believe men were the head of the house. They still are supposed to be. If you don't like that, all I can tell you is go read you a book by some atheist. Maybe you'll like that. That's the Bible, where her Lord was till it was light. Verse 27, and her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was falling down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. It was like that. He's laying there. Now, it don't say she was dead then. She probably was. She either died then or she died when she fell down or she died on the way home. But he picks her up and puts her on his donkey. Verse number 27. Her hands were on the threshold. 28. And he said unto her, Up, let us be going. And none answered. She didn't say a word. Then the man took her up upon an ass. And the man rose up and got him unto his place. Took her home. And all the way home he thought about that. And all the way home he thought, What has happened? To my nation. What has happened to my people? These children of Benjamin. 
acting worse than heathen. Homosexuality. They've beaten the doors in. They raped my wife and killed her. I wish everybody could know about this. I mean, people's got to know about this. This has got to, we've got to stop stuff like this from happening. I ain't never heard telling nothing like this happen. Now notice what he does. Notice what he does. Strangest story in the Bible. Verse 29. And when he was coming to his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces and sent her into all the coast of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it. Take advice. Speak your mind. Look at what's happened. Let's look at this real closely here tonight. Verse twenty, verse number twenty-nine. He's, he's. I mean, you say, well, brother Danny, that that I can't believe that's in the Bible. The Bible is an honest book. It tells it like it is. You know it nowadays as a chainsaw massacre. The zombie killers, the, the HLN specials that you watch where it shows blood. O.J. Simpson took a knife, cut them up, all that left their blood over there. Don't come to me saying, oh, how gross. I can't believe God put that in the Bible when you've got ten times that every week on your TV. Our society have put this out to shame. That Cornell guy down there in Houston, Texas, got young boys and turned them naked and hung them and cut their body and buried them in those storage buildings. I don't know how many of them, 50 or something like that. That Holmes guy, over 200 women, with the worst mass murder in the United States history. David, uh, 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 oh, what's his name, Ted Bundy. All of them, homosexual murders, most of them, where they cut people up, eat their bodies, hack them into pieces, so it divides this woman up into 12 pieces. Now, I hate to sound so gross, but that would be, that would be I, the only way I could figure that out. If you, took, if you took a hand, there's one. If you took from there to there, two, three, or maybe the hand, one, and from there to there, two. So he cut her here, took that knife and cut them bones, had to saw them, put that in a package. There's one, two, three, four, five would be the head. Six, seven, both feet, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then the body, twelve. I don't know that. That's probably something like that is the way he did it. So he cuts her, he cuts her body up, puts that one in a package, addresses it to the tribe of Ephraim, puts a hand in another package, takes, a, takes all these down to the post office, gets down there to the post office, puts them down there. He sent her to all the twelve tribes of Israel and put a little note in there and said, do you know what's going on in your country? Does this not bother you? They'd never heard of nothing like that happening. It shook people up. I mean, the guy sitting there saying, uh, how'd you like these scent? Is there anything liquid, fragile, perishable? Not, uh, you know how they ask you that at the post office? Uh, no, don't have to worry about nothing in here. And uh, he put those packages in there. There was that woman's. Uh, you say, that's awful. Yes, sir, it sure is. I'm telling you, that's the results of sin, ladies and gentlemen. The human mind and heart has no limit to how low it will sink when it's not right. Listen, human beings will do stuff dogs and animals won't do when they get away from God. The human heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? He mailed it and sent it all out and said, take advice and speak your mind. Now let's see what the results were in chapter 20, and I'm done. Chapter 20. You know what happened? Verse 1, and all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan to Beersheba. You know why it says from Dan to Beersheba so much? You that don't read the Bible don't even know that. But if you read it, it says that a lot. From Dan to Beersheba, talking about from the north part to the bottom part, from top to bottom, Dan to Beersheba. And buddy, he said from Dan to Beersheba, they all got together, and they said, look, we're going to have to do something about this. We're going to get these people. We're going to have them killed. And verse 2 said there was 400,000 people footman that drew sword. Now when the children of Benjamin, they were involved in this crime, heard, verse 3, 
that the children of Israel were going to come to get them, they said to the children, tell us, how was this wickedness? So this Levite, they put him on the news, and he stepped up there, the husband of the woman, and he said, uh, I came to Gibeah that belonged to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me, verse 5, and beset the house round about upon me by night, and thought to have slain me. And my concubine have they forced raped her, that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and, and counsel. And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go into his tent, neither will we return unto his house, but this shall be a thing which we'll do. We'll go up by a lot against it. Now stop right there. Verse 7 said, we're going to give our account. Now, there's no difference in the crime on scene, JFK murders. You've seen John F. Kennedy get his head shot a hundred times on TV. You've seen that bloody, gory mess. People just say, ooh, blood, God. we're going to watch this new movie. They cut heads off and everything. Listen, you're, you're sick if you enjoy that. There's something wrong with you. You're not supposed to like that. You're not supposed to let your kids see stuff like that. There's some things God don't want us to see, uh, in, even in war and stuff like that. And, brother, you know what they said? All the people, verse 8, said, we'll do this as one man. They all got together in that communical movement. They all gathered together. And verse 11 said, all of them were knit together as one man. They voted right. It's a shame it took a tragedy to get them together, but sometimes it takes a terrible thing for us to come together and do what we're supposed to. 9-11, when that happened, you remember how people were humbled there for a little while? Churches filled up. People got right. People repented. Didn't last long, though, did it? Two or three weeks, people was right back doing the same old thing. But this shook them up. There's a lot better people than we are in our country today. This tore them up. 400,000 men went out to fight. Now, let's look at verse 13. They want to bring these men to justice. Whoever did this, they're going to die. The liberals jumped up and said, no, these men deserve a fair trial. They were born this way. You can't judge them. Born that way. Here's my little footnote. Here's my commentary. If them homosexuals were born that way and they couldn't help it and they couldn't help it because all they were attracted to is men, how come they took that woman and abused her all night? They ain't born that way. They're, they're sexual perverts. Now, I know that'll get me in trouble and I know I'll be criticized for that, but... So they took the woman when they couldn't get the man. That's just perversion. They wasn't just attracted to men. There's so much truth in here, some of y'all can't even swallow it. You might get this CD and listen to it a few times. There's so much stuff ahead of USA Today and CNN and Fox News in here. This King James Bible leaves them a million miles behind in the dust. Let's finish it up. Look what happened. 14. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together to battle against the children of Israel. Here you got brothers fighting against brothers. Isn't that what sin divides? Does it divides us and makes own families turn against each other? How many families turned against each other because one person in the family is full of the devil and makes a big fight, drugs and homosexuality and all kinds of sin, and all kinds of wickedness and stuff like that. Ladies and gentlemen, think about the wickedness that turns families against families when there's sin in them. The children of Israel are going to fight the children of Benjamin. Now notice, the children of Benjamin only had 26,000 and the children of Israel had 400,000. So it would be like 400 men fighting 26 men. Verse 16. And all this people were uh, among the children of uh, Benjamin. Here it gets a little weirder. Were 700 left-handed men that could sling stones at a higher breath and not miss. Now who in the world them fellas come from? You got 700 left-handed men that we'll study when we get into our study of the book of Judges. And they could sling a stone at a hair's breath. That's pretty good. And not miss. They can sling right here, back there, back, and knock your brains out. They say, they say that a man with a sling that was good could do it 200 yards, two football fields. 
and knock me up. Bing! You be walking along, ain't nobody hit me. Somebody way over yonder, 200 yards away, slap you upside the head and you wouldn't know what hit you. A rock that big hits you right in the head from 100 yards, brother, you're out, you're gone, you're done. And they had 700 of them guys. Well, look at what happened in the story. 700, uh, 400 to 26. And the children of Israel arose, verse 18, and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God. That's a good idea. And said, which of us shall go up first? They didn't say, should we go? They said, we're going. Which one goes first? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and camped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin, and the army of Israel put themselves in array to fight at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day 20 and 2,000 men. Them guys, 26 against 400, killed 22,000 Israelites. Now keep up with these statistics. Here's 22,000 men died. 22,000 women didn't have no husband. 22,000 kids didn't have no daddy. Oh, listen, when we get to heaven, you're going to find out all the hell that was caused sometimes because of one person's sin. The third generation, fourth generation, on down. Sin is awful, kids. Sin is awful. Sin is awful. You're always hurting. You're never just saying, well, I ain't hurting nobody but myself. You're hurting everybody you know, everybody that knows you, or your, your family. You hurt everybody around you when you sin. And maybe people you don't even know. Long story short, the children of Israel went up and wept, verse 23, and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, shall we go up? Now they're getting somewhere. And the Lord said, go up. Go up. That didn't guarantee them a victory. They went out and got whipped again. Another 18,000. That's 40,000 of good children of Israel got killed. 18,000 got killed in verse 25. Verse 26, Then they went up and came to the house of God and wept and sat before the Lord and fasted. They fasted, Look, we're, how, are we going to do this or not? Now, the Lord says, You're ready to fight. Verse 29, that means this. Just because you're in the right don't mean you're going to win. Sometimes you go up against evil, you ain't got the power of God on you enough that evil will beat you. Sometimes they'll overcome you. They lost, they lost the battle and they was in the right because they didn't have the power of God on them like they should have. You can't go out. David couldn't fight that giant brother until he got that sling and got to kill the, giant, kill the, uh, the bear and the lion. You have to be ready to go out there to fight. Verse 30. The children went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day. This is the third battle. And put themselves in array. And they tricked them this time. The children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city and they began to smite of the people and kill as at other times in the highways of which one goeth to the house of God and other Gibeah in the field about 30 men of Israel. And they tricked them this time. They laid an ambush. And the children of Benjamin said, They are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said, Let us flee and draw them from the city to the highway. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in a battle against Baal Tamar and the liars in wait. This is Ai over there in Joshua all over again, if you know the story of Ai. Came forth of their places out of the meadows of Gibeah. The silent majority, the silent majority rose up. And there came out against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men of Israel and the battle was sore. But they knew not that evil was against them. And this time, verse 35, the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed the Benjamin at that day, 20 and 5,000 and 100 men and drew the sword. And they saw they were smitten. And verse 41, and when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed, for they saw that evil was come from them. Verse 46, and all that fell that day of Benjamin were twenty and five thousand men that drew sword. Verse 48, And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword as well the men of every city as the beast and all that came to mind. And they set them cities on fire. Now I read that verse to show you this. When they come to them cities, have you ever wondered why God said kill man, woman, be, you say, well, that's awful, that's horrible. Them cities were eat up 
with diseases. And the only way they could keep them from getting in the congregation of Israel is to destroy them. That's why they had to burn them, and that's why they had to kill them animals. People were having sexual relations with the animals just like they're doing in America tonight. It's everywhere. Our countries eat up with it. And God said, burn it. Burn it down. You can't unteach it. You can't go in there and reform it. It's gone. It's shot. I've given it over. Burn it to the ground. And that's exactly what he's going to do to America. Well, that's hard. That's hard preaching right there if I am doing it. But I'm telling you, brother, that's a handwriting on the wall. Our country's gone tonight, folks. There's only one hope for our country, and that's revival. If we don't have revival, it's ruined for this country. America's doomed. It's gone. The handwriting's on the wall. The judgment of God is on our country if we don't have revival in this country. And it starts right at the house of God. Right. It starts with people just like you here tonight getting down on your knees and saying, God, I'm going to get right. God, I'm going to do right. God, I'm going to rededicate my life. God, I'm getting all the junk out of my life. God, I'm throwing out all the dirty movies out of my house. God, I'm getting rid of the rock and roll, the rap music. God, I'm going to clean the house. Get my life right. The only hope we got is revival or ruin. He said, kill him. You ever wonder why David... God told David to hoe them horses, hot, hot, hemp, I cock them back here. Well, I mean, if you're an adult, you understand that. They were full of diseases, giving them, swapping them back and forth from people. And they burned them. And they forgot, as the book of Judges closes, we'll get this when we study it. They said, man, who are them guys going to marry? We killed all them people now. The Benjamites, who are they going to marry? And some of them guys went and hid in rocks, and they made them, they could have wives for them, so the tribe of Benjamin survived. And God had mercy. Do you know what caused it? The last verse of the book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. A society is destroyed when people say, I have a right to do whatever I want to do, I make my own rules. Nobody can tell me what to do. I'll do what I believe is right. You know you're gone when people start believing like that. You're gone. You're gone. And that, my friends, is the strangest story in the Bible. Take advice. Consider it. And speak your mind. Let's stand by our heads for prayer.